Well, it's been it's been going on for 500 years. I mean, Brazil was founded by plantation owners and a slave economy, uh, providing monoculture for northern markets. That's never really changed. I mean, there have been attempts to industrialize parts of the country industrialized, but mostly it's still, you know, a, a lot of its big exports are supplying the United States, Europe, Japan, and China with luxury products like sugar, their monoculture with beef, with um, coffee. You know, there have been, hun- you know, dozens of boom and bust commodity cycles and a big proportion of the power base, just as it was in the United States, you know, in the early years, are plantation owners, you know, like, look at the founding fathers. Yeah, right. What was Thomas Jefferson? You know, and the the thing is, uh, it's important to keep in mind that what's driving all of their power, what gives them their power are companies like Cargill from the United States, which is the richest corporation in the world. It made $152 billion last year, which is building, you know, soy ports in the middle of the Amazon jungle, soy terminals so they can ship soy overseas. It, you know, it's it's um, mining companies from Canada. It's, it's uh, you know, the U.S. doesn't get much of its beef from Brazil anymore, but it did during the time when all the rainforest was really aggressively being cut down. McDonald's was one of the biggest buyers of beef from Rondonia in the 1980s. So these these people, these ranchers, have a lot of political power, and they're overrepresented in Congress so that they have a caucus in Congress, which spans almost all of the political parties. And, you know, Brazil's like 15% of the population is rural, but something like 40 or 50% of the people in Congress are big rural landowners, big ranchers and farmers. So the political, and these are families that have had power for a long time. It's very hard to get rid of, you know, so so that's the situation. They're backed by international capitalist interests so that they're hard to, for locals to get rid of. And now they're backed, you know, they're, their aggression is now totally backed by the current government. You know, in, in Rondonia, where fires were up in the six counties around Porto Velho when I was there last week by 290% this year, most of happening on indigenous reservations and things. Um, the governor is from Bolsonaro's political party. He's a former military police colonel, and he's uh, backed by the cattle ranchers. And, uh, you know, he, he, Bolsonaro got 72 percent of the vote in this state. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, it's, wow. you know, it's not it's not a very good situation right now politically. There, There's no sign, for example, that the local government's going to do anything to stop the fires. In fact, the fire department in the state of Rondonia, uh, I have a friend who's a journalist there. She called them up to learn about their plan, how they were putting out fires. They called the plan um, No Fires 17. 17 is the number, the ballot number of Jair Bolsonaro's political party. So they used the fire extinguishing efforts as a way to campaign for him. Oh my God. <laughs> Man. Um, no. Yeah, that's that's crazy, and it, and I think this may be the same journalist that you uh, mentioned in this article uh, that for Brazil Wire that you wrote Amazon in flames on the ground in Porto Velho, um, and in that you you quote her saying, uh, "We warned everyone that this was going to happen." She said, "We said that President Bolsonaro's rhetoric would pull a mental trigger. He gave the order when he relativized the issue of environmental crimes, when he discredited the work of the environmental protection agencies, and when he ridiculed the fines, he gave an order. He said, do it. So what has Bolsonaro's effect been on environmental regulation? Um, How has he allowed for this space, for this type of thing to happen? After the 2016 U.S.-supported coup in Brazil, one of the first things that Michelle Temer, the new president, did was cut funding to the environmental protection agencies by 51% across the board. And so this caused a spike in new fires, nothing compared to right now. What Bolsonaro did after taking office is he fired uh, the state environmental protection agency superintendents in 22 states, including Hondonia, in February. And he hasn't replaced any of them yet, so that their bureaucracies are all crippled. They can't do anything without getting authorization from uh, the federal government in Brasilia 
the federal environmental minister is now run by a rancher who has been accused of committing environmental crimes and is also apparently a white supremacist. I was just giving an interview with some Canadian white supremacist on the radio this week. It's just a whack job, you know? So, so they're crippled. They can't even do anything. They, like, they can't, they don't have the autonomy to arrest somebody anymore for starting a fire or cutting down trees on an indigenous reservation or in a national park. You know, that's just been like, they have to get the okay from Brasilia first and that's not coming. So the other thing is he, he cut funding for the agency to fight uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change by 95%. And he, and when the director of the scientific, um, the space research Institute, which is a governmental agency that works with an analysis of satellites, photos, and things like that. Uh, when he produced a report that said forest fires were going out of control in the Amazon, Bolsonaro told him he was crazy. He was just spreading fake news uh, because he's connected to environmental NGOs or something. And the guy like fought back against Bolsonaro and he got fired. And now that agency is not release, releasing any new data. So he's just like, Buried all of he, then he's went on. He's accused like <laughs> just ridiculously, you know, accused international environmental NGOs like Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Federation of setting the fires <laughs> so that they could get more funding. Okay. You know? Yeah. That's... And so you know, and then oh, he said that he said it's an incursion into Brazil's sovereignty for foreigners to care about what Brazilians do to their property, right? Which is, a, you know, it's an argument. Sovereignty is a very important argument in the third world that, you know, countries should have their own self-determination without interference from Europe and the U.S. Except that in his case, he's just opened up the Alcantara rocket launching base in Maranhão on the edge of the Amazon to the U.S. military. It's the first time U.S. military are coming on Brazilian soil since World War II. He's going into joint military operations with Southcom. And since the coup, they've sold 75% of the petroleum reserves at below market rates up to the US and Europe and a little bit to China too. So he's not, he's not actually doing anything policy-wise that would suggest that he cares about sovereignty. In fact, he's kind of transforming Brazil into this US puppet state as it was in the 90s in a lot of ways, you know?